You're listening to The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, your escape to reality. Hello and welcome to The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. Today is Wednesday, March 6th, 2024, and this is your host, Stephen Novella. Joining me this week are Bob Novella. Hey, everybody. Kara Santamaria. Howdy. Jay Novella. Hey, guys. And Evan Bernstein. Good evening, everyone. So it's March, which means this is the month in the Northern Hemisphere where spring comes in. Yeah. Yay. That's, yay. Yes. Yes. Which means in New England, it's, it's nonstop raining. Yeah, which means but spring. It, it is our, yes. Daylight so, saving ends. And it gets Coming muddy and slippery soon. everywhere. Yeah, talking about that, oh my God, guys. So (laughs) my wife is work at work and she's away. Like, I'm not going to see her for two weeks, right? So I'm prepping for the show. And like, Steve and I are in the studio on Wednesday. So I'm get home and I'm always scrambling on Wednesday. So I'm like, all right, I'm not making dinner tonight. I'm going to order the kids some hamburgers. So, you know, I do DoorDash. It's raining. Guy pulls up on the street and the road parks his car on the road right in front of my house. And he gets out and he's coming straight to my door. And my front yard has a slope in it. And the guy took a header and slid down my front yard on his ass. The whole <laughs> oh, he was coming hell. down the grass. You don't do that. Oh, he was running. Like oh. he, I'm like, don't do it. Don't do it. And then when, he, when his ass the hit ra- the ground, baby, I went, baby, baby. whoa. You know, I was like. <laughs> <laughs> like a sound effect from so a movie So you're like almost. standing at the window just watching this? I have the door open because I usually <laughs> wave. I wave <laughs> to those guys audience. to let them know I'm here. You know, like come here, you know. So, oh, boy. <laughs> He, like a champ, this guy had the ha- bag of hamburgers above his head the whole way down. Yes. And, you know, as soon as he gets to the door, I'm like, two things. Like, I wanted to grab those hamburgers out of his hand quick because it's raining. <laughs> and two, I didn't want, you know, I didn't want, like, interaction with the guy. You know, I'm just like, dude, you know, I'm like, are you okay? And, and then I'm like, wait a second, just wait there, right? I go and I get him a roll of paper towels and a, and a garbage bag so he could, like, dry himself off. And it's like, he could sit on the garbage bag in his car, not get his seat wet. <laughs> But I'm oh like, my so I go upstairs, I give the kids their hamburgers, I go upstairs, I'm prepping. About 10 minutes later, I look out the window, he's still parked in front of my house. Aww. Oh, what's oh. drying off. Yeah, he's just Dry. like drying. And like, he, I saw him like in the car and he, I could see his face. The guy looked very shaken, you know, like, oh, it was a young okay. teenager. He was like 17 years old, you know. Yeah. That'll Don't teach run him. Down not wet to, yeah. So, Don't wet dash lawns. down. I Wet t- lawns I, for DoorDash. I tipped them an extra two dollars. I felt bad <laughs> for him. <nice. laughs> two dollars. That reminds me of the movie Young Frankenstein when you know, like he knees the guy in the balls. Oh, in yeah. the demonstration, <laughs> and he whispers <laughs> to his you guy, "Give him an extra dollar." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I pain and suffering. I would have tipped him two, more. I would have tipped him more, but no exaggeration. You know, if you guys ever done this. Okay. Five guys. It was going to cost over sixty dollars to get two hamburgers and two fries. Oh, is, my gosh. This is the story of my life living in L.A. because I order in too much. So, But and I ordered from way back so and it was only $40. So it hey, oh, okay. 20 Burger bucks a bargain. kid for a hamburger and fries. Like I'm like sitting well, there like, am I doing this? Am I doing this? Like, Yeah, because the it's like you've got the fees, you've got the, the service fee, the gas fee, the everything, and all of the prices on the menus are like whatever percent higher on the yep. delivery apps. Yeah. Because right. yeah. otherwise they lose money from what I understand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they can't yeah. make money otherwise. And it's marginal anyways. And so when you say you tipped him too, you meant on top of the tip you already gave him in the On app. top of like the yeah. extra. Yeah, like yeah. eight or nine bucks. I, wow, yeah. Jay. So I, I had a food <laughs> so delivery weird. snafu recently as well. We were ordering. Oh, like, boy. I can't remember which, which one of the food delivery things it was. But they – so we ordered from a local restaurant that we've been going to for 20 years. And the guy comes to the house to deliver the food. And so we looked at it and it was the wrong order. So we called the guy and told him you have to go back to the restaurant. You have to co- so he had to come back, get the food that he gave to us, and bring that to the restaurant, and then get our food and bring it back to us. And he did it? That would never fly here. Hang on. Why did you have to call? So he so he he grabbed the food to bring it back. He dropped off the food. Meanwhile, so we're waiting for our food. We know exactly how long it takes to get to this restaurant, right? It's like yeah. six minutes down the road. It's not coming. So we call the restaurant and they said, all right, so the guy came and dropped <laughs> off the food that he <laughs> incorrectly picked up previously, but then he didn't pick up your food. He just left. Yeah. Yeah. He ditched. You know, so we, and then we called, you know, the, the delivery place. And they said, well, they're not allowed to go to a house twice. Or to go to, <laughs> so like, you have to reorder it. 
I had to go pick up. I had to get out of my own house, <laughs> ah. drive down. Can you imagine ah. the horror? I had to pick up my own food. No. How terrible! No. Oh my! Uh, but they, but the thing is, this fun is, did you? I hope I hope you're seeing a, a, someone for this, Steve, to talk about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was very traumatic. So <laughs> yeah, we, but here's the thing. That, so I get if the, the guy, you know, he was pissed, but that's his. It was his problem, right? It's not yeah. our right. problem. But if he had no intention of bringing us our food. Tell us, right? Yeah, because we wasted the the yeah. twenty minutes that we were waiting for him to not bring our food back, and, and when he knew he had never had any intention of doing that, mm-hmm. it just wasted time with our food sitting there. Just tell us. Wait, listen. By the way, policy: we can't re-deliver the food, so you're going to have to get it yourself. Then I would. Yeah, he doesn't want to deal minutes. with you saying that. He doesn't want to take the heat for that. Right. Yeah, but now what he's, he's good, you know, whatever. We gave the worst possible review we can, you know, and yeah. there you go. But and also, also, you guys live in a, I mean, it's not a small town, but like he may be your driver again yeah. at some point. <laughs> yeah. So it's not like, like here things are just so different. Like, A, that would never happen. Like if you got the wrong food, you would just go in the app and be like, I got the wrong food. And they would be like, here's your money back. You just need to reorder. Like you're screwed. Like it is what it is. Eat that other person's food. All the time people misdeliver because they can't find my address because for whatever reason, in my development, oh. we have three different streets, and they decided to number all the houses the same. Oh, that's so convenient. people always drop it at the wrong house on the wrong street. Get someone else's mail? All the time. And so oh the problem is, I'm deep in the development, but the main street, the one at the very front, is a very busy public street. And so <sighs> delivery drivers will just drop it there because it's easier. They don't want to go into the development, they, they see the, the number, corner. and they drop it basically at the wrong house. And by the time you walk out to get it, it's been picked up by somebody who's unhoused. Yeah. Because where oh I live is just a very urban center. So it's like free food on the street. Right. It happens and all the time. How? Yes. So you got to be on it. You got to be on it. And I'm always the, like Amazon's always delivering my mail to my neighbor and I have to go get it off her porch. And I always make a point to like wave to her ring camera so she knows I'm not a package thief. Like, oh, this is mine. Oh, yeah, you have to name streets and de- in, within developments intelligently, right? It's so stupid. It's like we've got three different streets and they're named different things, but the numbers line up. Don't make number 800 right behind number 800. And you're not allowed to put some number on your own house and say, hey, it's 80 now and come no, to 80. No, you can't do that. But <laughs> I, did, yeah, I right? did get a literal doormat printed. I paid money to get a doormat custom made that has the number and name of my street on it. Yeah. Oh, my god. Because they'll drop it off at another street with that number. Yeah. <laughs> and it says in every delivery app, I live on this street, not that street. You'll know you're at the right house because the doormats. Yeah. Says so. <laughs> they still don't get that it. That is. I know. Bob, didn't you live in a development that had like a Huntington Court and Huntington Drive or something in the same <laughs> so development? So annoying. Yeah, it was, it was crazy. Then then they actually changed the name of it. But um, Oh, really? That's nice. Yeah, there, there, there was there, – but even better than that, there was a road, a series of roads, connected roads, not far from my house that had – you know, I forget the name of it, but it had the same name but Court, Lane, Street, and I think one other one. And I was yeah. like, who was on crack when they named these streets right next to each other? Can you imagine these poor people getting their mail and all the problems? Wait, 15 – 15 blah blah lane but i'm on 15 (laughs) blah blah street i'm like come on (laughs) that was actually when i lived in new york probably a lot of new yorkers who are listening to this right now are like nodding feverishly i lived on queens boulevard but i lived by 67th ave and in new york city or this is queens there's like a road a street and an ave for all those numbers but Mm -hmm. they're miles away so if they miss deliver you can't even just walk over and go get your mail Like yeah. you get off at the wrong subway stop or something, you're in the completely wrong neighborhood. If I if I ever run a food delivery service, I'm going to call it Dine and Dash. <laughs> oh wait, I, maybe I shouldn't do that. No, don't do that. <laughs> All right, Bob, you're going to start us off with a quickie. Thank you, Steve. This is your quickie with Bob, people. Uh, all right. Can we find new physics in the debris from neutron star mergers? That Probably. is the never, topic never for this quickie happened. with Bob. Yes, good <laughs> guess there, Steve. Neutron star mergers may give us the clues we need to finally find out what the hell dark matter is. Now, that's the matter, if you've never listened to the show before. That's the matter that we can't detect at all except for gravitationally yet. 
there's six times as much of it as there is all the matter, all that immense amount of matter that we can see. Multiply that times six. That's how much dark matter that we think there is. Now, when neutron stars collide, before becoming either, what do they become? Either a bigger neutron star or they become a black hole, right? Those are basically the two options. Before that happens, there's a brief amount of time where it, it creates, they believe, a hot remnant which is essentially like a huge physics experiment creating these exotic particles. The researchers think that the collision might create theoretical particles called axions, which have never been seen, but they're actually one of the more promising theoretical candidate particles for dark matter itself. So it's believed that these particles can move far enough away to have from from the amazing collision that had just happened they think they can go far enough away and have time enough to decay into particles that we know and can really easily detect, like photons, for example. Uh, So this new research shows that these electromagnetic signals caused by the decay should be detectable by gamma-ray telescopes, such as NASA's Fermilat telescope and future such telescopes. So in the future, when we detect neutron star collisions using gravitational wave astronomy, we may then quickly point our gamma ray telescopes at them and hopefully not only reveal brand new physics, but finally shed some light on mysterious dark matter at the same time. Cross your fingers. This has been your Quickie with Bob. Back to you, Steve. I like how you said shedding light on dark matter. Yes, thank you. Very (laughs) clever, Bob. Thank you, Evan. I I noticed. Jay, let me ask you a question. Yeah. What are you thinking of? Oh. Exactly. <laughs> Gosh, that's still funny. It's so funny. All right, guys, you know in The Expanse where, yeah. if you remember the show, <laughs> in New York City, they had to put a concrete barrier around the city to keep ocean water from flooding the city. Do you remember that visual? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. sure. Well, that's what was hitting me when I'm, I'm reading about this. So there was a recent study that was published in uh, Journal Nature, and this was done by Virginia Tech. So the study points out that rising sea levels and sinking land threatens 30 freaking two U.S. cities along the Atlantic, Pacific, and Gulf Coast. Now, this is just, they just studied those coastlines. This is happening globally, by the way, but this is just an idea of what's to come. So this includes highly populated cities like New York, Boston, San Francisco, and the cities that are the most at risk in the U.S. are Miami, New Orleans, Port Arthur, Texas, Foster City, California, Savannah, Georgia. I mean, it's like just tons and tons of cities here are going to be at risk from what's going to happen. And, and, you know, from the measurements that they took, it seems like it's definitely going to happen. So these findings, they estimated with these findings that they put over half a million people at risk of recurrent flooding. And if nothing is done to basically remediate the situation, the damages could reach over $107 billion by 2050. Now, we throw around billion a lot. And it's a number that people have gotten very used to. $107 billion is an unbelievable amount of money, right? You got, we got to mm. keep that in mind. Even though, you know, our governments around the world throw around money like it's nothing. It is a huge amount of money that, that taxpayers have to absorb. So there's several other increases uh, that they estimated out. They were saying between 500 and 700 square miles of land will be flooded. There'll be up to 518,000 people affected. And there'll be up to 288,000 more properties that were exposed uh, to the water, an estimated value of another $32 billion. It has to be taken seriously here because uh, 30% of the U.S. population lives where? In coastal cities, right? You know, these are, these are some of the first cities that, you know, when, when settlers come, they make cities right near the ocean, right? Because it, you know, and, that- you know, places like Australia, I mean, aren't they entirely coastal? For the most part, like, no, like 98% the of their people live. But yeah, I mean, the that's interiors what the cities are. are. Yeah. Yep. So they're but, I mean, saying- it's, not, it's not that that's all the land is not coastal, but yeah. No, no, but there. this is where the people are. Yeah. Yeah. They are on coasts. So the, the study projected that the sea level will rise up to one foot or 0.3 meters by 2050. How much is a foot when it comes to where the ocean is? You know, that is significant. That's a, that's oh, a yeah, that's, major increase. Oh, yeah, that's enough to decimate a city. Yep. So previous forecasts, they didn't account for a few things here, which I think you guys will find interesting. There's a, a rapid rate in which these cities are actually sinking too, right? They're going down, like the ground is sinking down and compressing underneath them. The study used data from uh, a radar system that was used to map sinking areas in these cities. Now, the data shows that coastal cities could sink by as much as 0.2 inches or 5 millimeters each year. So that's going to add up quick. So this significantly increases the relative sea level, right? 
So, you know, these flood risks are, are getting worse, not just because ocean levels are rising, but because the ground is is sinking. Why yeah, two is, things are combining to make it a bigger problem than just just the uh, rising water. Absolutely. And what the hell? Why is the ground sinking, right? Well, there's a few factors here. The overall weight of cities increases as they build more buildings and everything. Hey, and it adds up. You know, you might not think it, but, you know, when you put that much stone and, you know, you, you, cities use a lot of stone to build and everything and a lot of paving, a lot of concrete sidewalks and all that stuff, like the, the weight can become astronomical. We also have post-Ice Age shifts in coastal land, right? So the land is shifting around. And the big one here is the extract, extraction of gas, water, and other resources. So what they're basically doing is they're hollowing out huge, huge parts of, you know, internally, they're hollowing out all this stuff. They're taking out oil. They're taking out gas. So the, the land has actually a place to go. Like it needs to go down, right? Because gravity is just going to continuously be pulling that land down. So we have a recipe for a real disaster here. So it's estimated that more than 90% of the ocean is also absorbing atmospheric greenhouse gases, and this expands the seawater. So like the volume of seawater is increasing as well. So we have all these different factors here that are leading to this inevitability that these coastal cities are going to get smacked with seawater. The uh, the sinking land and, and climate-driven melting of glaciers and ice sheets, you know, right? That's That's where... Predominantly, a lot of this water is coming from. This triples the change in relative sea levels around these areas. That's very significant. I mean, I'm I'm pretty worried about this. I mean, you know, my my children's generation is going to be living. You know, they're going to be in the middle of their lives in the 50s. You know, how many years away are we from the 50s at, at this point? You're almost 25 26. years, right? Not that yeah, not that long. The uh, the researchers identified these regions that are most at risk and estimated. The, uh, the potential human and economic impacts of the future flooding. So they found that without taking any preventative actions, one in 50 people living in these 280,000 properties along the U.S. coast will likely be affected by this. And unfortunately, it says that minority and low-income groups will bear most of the damages. The study also suggested that limiting the extraction, the extraction of natural gas and groundwater, you know, this will help reduce further landmass sinking. You know, how likely is that going to be? Not. You know, by the time they, they, the government gets around to slowing down or stopping natural gas extraction, there won't be any more gas, right? That's the way I look at it. The cost to mitigate these issues will be, of course, much less if we start dealing with them now. Like we, would, we need to bend money towards these problems, you know, start figuring out how to, how to protect these cities. I don't know. I mean, is there ever a situation where they say, okay, forget it? Like, we, we're going to abandon the city and, and just repopulate these people? I can't Can imagine. we look to Europe to the, some of the models they've used to protect their cities? Because they've had to deal with this as well. I mean, I'm sure if anyone is doing anything about it, Ev, I'm sure that they're going to take all the information that they can get. But it's going to be expensive, you know? And, and Absolutely. There's always cost. You know, yeah. prevention is harder than dealing with something after the fact because – a lot of people like could just say, ah, we don't need to do that right now. You know, it's easy to put off. Like global warming, this is something that like, you know, we can't quickly solve these problems. Like we need to to really start talking about it and, and getting the money lined up that we're going to need to to solve these problems. And again, this is global. This is happening everywhere. This is not theoretical. And we know on paper it's not theoretical, but we've lived it. Like we know what happened in New Orleans. We know what happened in Houston. We should be learning from these experiences and we're – I mean we are to some extent but not nearly as dramatically slow as we react. should. Yeah. Slow, too slow. Yep. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I mean, yeah. From what, from what I've been reading, it's mainly on the east coast of the U.S. at least. It's mainly groundwater pumping like we're, you know, we're pumping water for use. But also, you know, one of the, I, I had one question because we've talked previously about the fact that the receding ice sheets from the from the glacial period actually is causing the round the ground to rebound a little bit, right? Because the land was sinking down under all that ice, and then that the ice yeah, it's has, still coming up. And the, it's so cool, but after, but, after so long, uh, yeah. New York City, for example, was just outside of the most recent ice sheet, uh -huh. so it actually increased it it was pushed up like the the oh. land next to it was pushed down it was pushed up and then when the ice melted 
it's now sinking back down to where it was before. Oh, oh yeah. I see. Interesting. Yeah. yeah so like a ridge was... formed, and now it's re- now I'm going back to where it was before. I also yeah. think this is such a problem, Steve, and I, I, I bet you would agree with this. I actually saw an article recently about like the problem with averages and this mm-hmm. idea that the statistic, the mean, is incredibly useful. And when it was first invented, it like really changed the way we thought about things. But we rely so heavily on this concept of average that we forget about variance. Yeah. And so it's like, oh, on average, we've got, you know, temperatures and, you know, at 1.5 C or on average, we've got, you know, one foot or whatever. That means that there are places that have two and three and four times that. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah exactly. Yeah, so it, the, the, the difference between the worst and the best could be pretty extreme. Mm-hmm. And this is this is no difference. Like, yeah, the average sea levels may be rising like by centimeters, but that doesn't mean that in some places it could be significant significant much earlier all right let me ask you guys a question you know i like to start with questions what do you think would happen to somebody if they got 217 covid vaccinations over the last two years i know Uh, i call that acupuncture aren't there 217 points on the body i read about this steve i'm shocked yeah was he called for a psych consult did that happen to him yeah, so we don't have a lot of personal information about the guy okay. or why he did it. Like, that wasn't mm-hmm. explored. And there's a, a article in The Lancet recently. Re- it's a case report. 62-year-old gentleman in Germany who decided, for whatever personal reasons, that he needed to get 217 <laughs> COVID oh, vaccines. My God, it's just incredible. It, yeah. You, mostly the mRNA ones. And so they were interested. This is a this is an interesting opportunity to say, well, like we would never, we would never deliberately do this, right? Mm-hmm. But in medicine, we often will gather safety take information advantage of eccentric people from say? from outlier cases. So like for example, <laughs> yeah, sometimes people do weird things, right? Sometimes it's like a deliberate yeah. overdose, for example, or it could have been an accidental overdose, or it could have just been somebody like really not listening to medical advice. Ooh, a friend of mine got snake venom in his eye for a TV show, and he ended up in a case study. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Sometimes you, 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 but you don't want to be a case. Study. No, you don't want to be a you case don't want, study. As I often tell students, you never want to be an interesting case. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's not what you want to be. But yeah, you know, so this is just one of those cases where somebody did something weird, you know, and then we say, okay, well, let's at least take a look and see, you know, what happened to the guy. And so there's a number of questions that they had. One was, is there any toxicity with that many doses? Two, two was, what was his immune reaction like? You know, did he get... Oh, yeah. How, how much super immunity did he get? And the third was, and this is an interesting one, did this basically exhaust his immune system, right? That's, yeah, that was a big question. What does that mean, there. Steve? Or did it induce any autoimmune issues or anything Well, like that's, that. yeah, it could have overstimulated yeah. the immune system. That's mm-hmm. the thing I would most worry about. But mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. the exhaustion is, what if he doesn't respond to new immune challenges as robustly as, as a healthy person because his immune system has just been depleted of whatever because it's been so, so stimulated. Like every two weeks he's getting another or whatever, every week he's getting another vaccine. He just doesn't have a chance to recover. So they said, all right, we'll take a look at all these things. So first, uh, let's look at the safety issue. The short answer is the guy has appear, apparently suffered no ill effects from getting 217 I got COVID sick vaccines. even after like each vaccine. Well, even I mean, only for like a day. Do you know how if he felt like crap? <laughs> so they yeah, they don't they don't go into that. He he had oh, okay. <laughs> he probably had the normal like sore arm and all that stuff, but he had no medical complications from doing this. No illness, no diseases happened. They also did. They said sixty two routine clinical chemistry parameters, which showed no abnormalities. So that means uh-huh. they looked at his kidney function. His kidneys were fine. His liver function was fine. He wasn't breaking down muscle tissue. Didn't his show any signs of autoimmunity. So because wow. all that you would have seen in like a 62 that's a lot of that's a lot of uh, blood parameters could they measure this concentration of medicine in it so well the medicine is Mm -hmm. just the mrna which would be gone by now right oh okay so yeah yeah but what they can measure is the is the second thing is looking at well how much immunity did the guy have right how much immunity can you get i mean there's got it's got a plateau at some point that that's what you would think, right? Haven't they done this to ra- ha- well? Haven't okay. they done this to anim- Have they done this to animals in prior studies? Not this, this much. Study? Not this. Nothing much. like this. Why huh? would they? It's like it's you way would- beyond what you would ever do. 
So what they found was that his <laughs> neutralizing antibodies was 5.4 times the control group. They had a control group of people who were, they call vaccinees, right? So these are people hmm. who had the normal vaccine schedule, right? Mm -hmm. So he had 5.4 times like the antibody capacity uh, against the spike proteins uh, for the wild type and 11.5 times for the Omicron B1.1.529 spike proteins. So that, which is, that's because that's most of the vaccines probably were targeting, you know, those proteins. So yeah, you know, five to 10 times, 11 times the amount of neutralizing capacity as people who just got the normal vaccine schedule. Oh my God. But not 650 times. No, no. But that's still a lot. <laughs> It is. It is. Now, here's an interesting thing. During the period where they were evaluating this guy for the study, he continued to get more vaccines. <laughs> Shocker. Shocker. Oh, God. I hope they got him a cycle. Of course he did. Because <laughs> there's got to be something going on there. It's expensive. We were just talking about the price of vaccines. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah, there's, there's this no is not cheap either. Well, I don't know what the German health care uh, No, they're not going like. to they're they not going to give a person 200 free vaccinations. Yeah, I they're like your that. card is real full, yeah. my friend. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I mean, I mean unless the German uh, health system is, you know, willing not to track. do something. Yeah, I, I, I don't know that. how he evaded any <laughs> tracking system that they have going on there, but he did. Yeah. Uh, but it probably <laughs> evolved a lot of cash payments. It would be my guess. Oh, yeah, I see. Probably. Now his his, <laughs> his T cell immunity was also higher, by the way, than the standard vaccine vaccine you know people and uh, the control group so then for the vaccines he received during the the evaluation period he continued to have a bump you know in his antibodies but it was muted right because he he already was so high like again you say you get diminishing returns at some point mm -hmm. uh, but he did have he did have an increase when he got um, when he got vaccinated but the, then the third thing they wanted to know is he never had COVID, by the way. That's the other thing. He didn't have the kind oh. of antibodies you would expect to have if you've ever been infected. Wow. So he was Go never in, never infected, which doesn't mean this is why, because you can't know from a single case. Right. He might like never yeah. leave his house other than yeah, to yeah, he's an isolated all, person. He, yeah, yeah. he may be a germaphobe. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. But he also, it may be directly because It of, could be. Of we just can't, we just could can't be. know. Right. You know. How many different facilities did he visit to, to get <laughs> this yeah, done? It makes you wonder. Steve, what, yeah. what would the medical profession expect someone what would they expect the outcome of this to be like wouldn't they i would imagine that this is would... all pretty much in line what i would expect to be okay. honest with you yeah right. right like had a lot of immunity. immunity to a point i and you know it, that's not you know 200 times that's about the safety margins we build in you know to stop okay. like this. I, you know I, I wouldn't expect the vaccine itself would have caused a problem again the one thing i would worry about is that it triggered an autoimmune reaction you know right like i'm surprised yeah I guess I'm not surprised, but it's interesting because you think about those rare cases where people get Guillain Barre, Barre yeah. or they get some sort right. of, and and he's really like pushing the like yeah, but that's literally a million to one, Kara. It is, but yeah. he's at six hundred fifty, <laughs> like he's pushing. Two hundred, but there's no way to know if he was like yeah. oh, two hundred seventeen genetically predisposed or yeah. something like yeah. that. Don't so. forget, uh, don't, don't forget know. the upside here, the real upside. This is showing yeah. that these vaccines are ridiculously safe. Yes. Yeah. Ridiculously, yeah. that is a key takeaway here. There is not any necessary toxicity that kicks in with higher doses, right? So here's the other thing: is the exhaustion question, right? So this is like this is probably mm -hmm. the most interesting question: is did his ability to respond to further antigenic challenges were that intact, or has he just wiped out his immune system because he's constantly yeah? Let's expose him to a bunch of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so what that found is that his his uh, ability to respond to stimuli was intact. intact no yep. apparent exhaustion at all, you know, from the, in the ways that they measured it. Yeah. Chalk one up to the human immune system. So, but yeah. and there's other yeah. things. we've actually been writing about this for quite some time, this kind of question, because this blows a pretty big hole in some of the anti-vaccine rhetoric, the whole too many, too soon kind of thing. They, they, yep. they've, they've been saying this kind of thing, for years, right. not not based on evidence, just based upon you're know, just trying to think of anything negative they could say about vaccines. That oh, you know, if you're you're basically using up the immune system, they're going to be vulnerable for other things. It, you know, <laughs> the immunity is nope. isn't, isn't good. All these things. No, nope. and this nope. yeah, this uh, and when one a part of our response was, you know, the antigenic stimulation that you get from a vaccine 
is pretty much insignificant compared mm-hmm. to your daily antigenic stimulation. You Just are getting exposure ex- to life. Yeah, yeah life right. is exposing yeah. you to hundreds yeah. of antigens a day, and we're just yeah. adding one more or a few at a time. It's nothing. It's nothing compared to what your immune system goes through on a regular basis. So you, there really wasn't a good reason to think that this would be a problem, right? So this kind of reinforces what we had suspected was that vaccines, it's, it's, it's not that vaccines are like massively stimulating your immune system. It's that they're targeting it against something yeah. very specific, but still you're getting tons of, uh, of antigenic stimulation just uh, just by going through life, you know? I remember the first time I discovered, because this is me being, how do you put this, um, not terribly organized, is that I get a flu shot every year like everybody mm-hmm. does, right? Mm-hmm. Or like we hopefully do. do. I'm not always great. I have a yellow card that has like my hepatitis vaccines and my yellow fever vaccines and typhoid and all those good things that I've had over the years from all my travels. I I don't usually document when I get my flu shot unless I'm doing it through work. And so there have been multiple years where I was like, did I get one already? (laughs) And I remember having to ask the pharmacist or call my doctor or look it up and be like, is it dangerous to get? And they're like, no, you can just get another one. Yeah, right. What's going to happen? Better safe than sorry. The the other thing I was thinking about with this is that, like, again, if, if there is anything to be worried about, it would be the adjuvants that's part of the vaccine, not the vaccine itself, but the other stuff that they give to help stimulate your immune system. What did you call it? Adjuvants. Adjuvants. Gesundheit. Yeah. (laughs) And so there you might think, all right, that's a lot of these other things that they put in the vaccine, you know, two times 217. But apparently that wasn't a problem either because it didn't, it didn't show any, this is a pretty extensive evaluation that they did of this guy and he didn't seem to be any worse for wear. So, and, and did they, did he give a reason why he did this to prove the point? Not discussed in the article. Yeah, they, we need they, to find him. They respected him. his privacy. No, nope, it's H I M. That's all we know about him. Mm. It, hmm. Just those initials. So yeah, fascinating little case report there. You know, I'm not sure how generalizable this information is, but if anything, it's reassuring. You know that somebody can do this and with no ill okay. effects. Doesn't right. mean that everybody can do it. You know, or that this is a good idea. It's or just that do it. yeah. We're no, right. <laughs> and to be clear, we're not recommending this. Just get the vaccines that are recommended. You know, no more, no less. Also, I wonder when, like, I wonder if this ramped up later in the pandemic or if early on he was, like, getting, because, like, that means he was taking vaccines away from people who needed them. Yeah, yeah. Like, do you well, remember how hard it was early on? There was, like, waiting lists and no, apparently phases. This was early on, but then That's there what was I mean. This was the whole time. This was not just all recently. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There, yeah, there, so there early on, like, he's like, he's like, get out of the way, old man. I'm getting yeah. my 17th vaccine. That's terrible. Right. Hopefully when the study was over, they had a serious talking to. <laughs> <laughs> I know. That's when they had the psych console. Yeah, okay. that's when they had the psych console. I hope so. Um, all right. Kara, mm-hmm. tell us about conspiracy theories about diseases that, you know, may or may not exist. Mm-hmm. So I love this. Uh, every week I send Steve multiple articles that I think are interesting. And I'm like, which one will fit best in the show? And he picks the one, you know, based on what other people are doing. And he goes, you had me at conspiracy theories. <laughs> That's <laughs> yep. his response this week. Things. So how many of you have heard of Disease X? Uh, I mean, I know. Uh, I know is that a to. musical artist? I know. There, I know Chemical X that created the Powerpuff Girls. I've Chemical heard of Planet X. X. Okay. Planet I heard of Malcolm X. X. Anybody? Malcolm yes. X. But disease X, I mean, this is some scary stuff, guys. Like, are you prepared for disease X? Have you? Oh, yeah, yeah. I got you... my X uh, oh. shot, so I'm good. Okay, is there so a here's vaccine the X? <laughs> yeah, right. So the World Health Organization at the World Economic Forum earlier this year decided to speak about disease X. Mm-hmm. And this was a fake or a theoretical pandemic. Right. So this is not a real disease. This is just a what if something happened wherein this disease, blah, 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 blah. So they talked about disease X in a panel, I think, at the World Economic Forum. And people took that and ran with it. So what do you think that they what do you think that happened after this fake disease Oh, it was a panel. In so January, they started so selling for fake disease cures X. for disease X. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they claimed it was that real. It's a conspiracy. 
The usual conspiracy yeah. is they want to either make people dumb so they're easier to control, or they want to depopulate the earth. How man, these conspiracy theorists must be terrible because they are doing an <laughs> awful job of depopulating the earth. Right. Yeah. So. So. Yeah. It, yeah. It's going to depopulate the earth. It's going to make us docile. It's going to make us easier to control. So and. AFP, which is, you know, one of the big three news organizations, There's AP, Reuters, and AFP, they're like the big wire services. AFP did a deep dive on this, and their fact checkers believe that the conspiracies started <clears throat> in the United States, thank you very much, um, but quickly spread over the globe and have become quite yeah. popular in Asia in a lot of different um, local languages. Um, one of the big pushers of this conspiracy. Can you guys guess who it would be? Alex Jones. Alex Jones. I'm surprised he's still doing this. Isn't he like, Why? no, he cannot be muzzled. Well, he I has just, to work to pay his bills, doesn't yeah, he? Yeah, I know. I just didn't know how much they, I don't know, all these lawsuits. Anyway, so um, he is pushing this as a, quote, genocidal kill weapon. That's what... So disease X is going to be deployed globally. Oh my gosh. I'm not sure by whom, by you know the the powers that be um, right. as a genocide. The Illuminati. They, yeah, yeah, the there Illuminati. They. they. So, exactly. We they. don't need to know who. Yeah. They. Oh, uh, we've also got some. Uh, as it got to China, then we we start seeing a lot of conspiracies around the Chinese government opening up mobile cremation ovens to cope with the mass deaths from disease X, which, by the way, again, does not exist. And there were photos that were often linked to these huh. posts shared on TikTok and Twitter. Turns out they were all pet cremation services. Those were the photos that were being used. But of course, we're no longer in a situation where you even have to misattribute a, a vague photo to... Uh, push your conspiracy now we can just ai them right oh, sure. we can just make them and, and so, can be even more convincing than exactly. rehashing some old photo from t five years ago yeah it can have a sign on it that says disease x crem cremations this way i mean it's ridiculous right so we're seeing that yeah people are pushing calls for taking vaccines for disease x disease x does not exist so the vaccine for disease x does not exist um, these things being uh, engineered in a bio lab. Oh, and then we've got basically people, as you would expect, selling cures. Oh, yeah, there right? you go. That's there it is. Mm -hmm. Ching ching. Yep. So these medical emergency kits, often including ivermectin, often including uh, drugs that we already have debunked uh, against COVID-19. I'm sure some herbal remedies are in oh, there, yeah. too. All, all the things you would expect for, you know, the low, low price of however much they're asking. <laughs> um, yeah, we've got, let's see, there's wow. a right-wing website called the Gateway Pundit. Um mm -hmm which is promoting these kits and sponsored posts. So if you are online and you're seeing sponsored posts that are targeted to you, if you've looked up this kind of content before, um, the titles are Disease X, Are the Globalists Planning Another Pandemic? Don't Be Caught Unprepared. Wow. And so obviously we see that this is a huge problem. Um, the AFP, again, who, who did most of the reporting on this, is showing that these conspiracies do in this situation at least tend to be somewhat partisan. We tend to see them on the severe right wing, like the most kind of extreme side of the right wing, obviously not anywhere in the kind of moderate partisan politics. And that sadly, over the past several months to years, we've seen mass cuts to content moderation across social media platforms, especially things like, I know I keep saying Twitter because I just refuse to call it X, but X is not moderating the content the way that they used to. Um, and we're seeing that, you know, these conspiracy theories are just being pushed, pushed, pushed. The disinformation then, of course, as we know, starts to get hyped and hyped and hyped. And then before you know it, somebody heard something about a thing, about a thing, about a thing. And it becomes part of the mainstream rhetoric, you know? It doesn't always stay siloed in the extreme conspiracy theory world. The little chatters, the little niblets of, of misinformation get sort of washed over after enough exposure and after enough kind of games of telephone. What ends up happening is, oh, yeah, I've heard of disease. Yeah, that's a, that's a worrisome one. That's the next one, right? It's like, no, this isn't even this was a this was a panel basically urging world leaders to make sure that their pandemic readiness was where it needs to be.
is a placeholder. It's uh, it's it's crazy. It's a hijacking, and it's uh, and once and kind of once it's out of the barn, you can't chase it down with the truth no. or with the evidence. It, it's, it, it yeah, becomes the genie a is out attempt. of the bottle. It's done. You, yeah, you can't you can't recork it. And I think the hard thing. I mean, here's a good quote from Chunai Chi, who's a professor at Oregon State, and I so apologize if I um, pronounce that name wrong. Disinformation can lead to some segments of the population taking up either ineffective or even harmful measures during an epidemic. It can become a major barrier for a society to be proactive in preparing and preventing an emerging, an emerging contagious disease. So that's the other really scary thing. This important exercise in urging world leaders to be prepared for what's next, saying, you know, what did we learn from COVID and how can we be better prepared next time? The people who take that information, who run with it in a pseudoscientific way, are actually undoing the good work, right? They're actually Mm -hmm. negatively impacting the important proactive, preparative work and preventive work for these global pandemics. Because the thing is, it will happen. Disease X will happen. It'll be called something else. We don't know what type of virus it'll be. It might be a coronavirus. It might be a fungus. It might be, um, you know, a, a type of influenza or something else. It will happen. And if just like in the movie, which one was it? Was it Contagion? I remember rewatching that during COVID. Was it Jude Law's character in yeah, Contagion? Yeah. yeah. He's such a perfect example of this conspiracy. I mean, they did such a great job kind of showing what happens. Um, this conspiracy theorist walking around and basically undoing the good public health work that's being done mm-hmm. because people look at those very loud voices as somehow equal and opposite to legitimate evidence-based public yeah. health. And, and history messaging. bears this out. This is not mm-hmm. certainly by no means the first time this has happened. It's just more amplified now with internet. But yeah. this is what the conspiracy theorists do. They take the normal functioning of whatever government institutions would have you and then, you know, partly out of ignorance, partly out of just the desire to see the conspiracy, they interpret anything in a sinister way. The yeah. cell phone, you know? right? Cell phone, yeah. See, those, uh, those, 5G, 5G and yeah. all that. But it's like, yeah, see those crematoria over there? That's for the mass murdering that they're going to do. Or you see... Yeah, it's not a, not a pet cr- Or <laughs> like <laughs> FEMA preparing for disasters. They're preparing for the culling, you know, whatever. Like you just turn it into right, anything yeah. sinister. And I'm not making those up, by the way. These are things I've heard from actual yeah. human beings yeah. who believe this. Um, yeah. Anyway... It's, uh, it's yeah, that's the world we're living in. And Evan, oh, yeah. it, it's even yeah, here, <laughs> here we go. We go. <laughs> <laughs> it gets Good worse, folks. Yeah. It gets worse. Tell us about well. how celebrities contribute to this sort of thing. All right. Well, okay. Maybe not worse. I don't want to. I really don't want to equate this to health. Yeah. You know, yeah, directly. Yeah. But but you know, we, we do have to address this. I saw two headlines this week that offer a peek into celebrity culture intersecting with pseudoscience. And I don't know, maybe this headline hit your news feed catchers today because it came out today. I saw it at the website Fandom Wire. And here's the headline. Even Neil deGrasse Tyson lost it after Amber Rose's dumb pseudoscience question. Mm. Neil deGrasse Tyson's criticism has angered many supporters of astrology and star-related sciences. What? Oh, my gosh. All right. So first thing, I will admit, perhaps the biggest news in this to me is that there's a person named Amber Rose. Oh, you don't know Amber Rose. <laughs> no, I don't. And I, you know, shame on me, I guess. But I'm just not, the, I'm not, I'm, I'm just not into celebrity culture really that much these, these days. So, you know, apologies for that. According to Wikipedia, uh, she's uh, an American model, rapper, and television personality. She initially rose to fame uh, by having a business relationship with Kanye West, I guess, the two of them. And they were hooked up for a little while and then but then she got her own show on a channel here a music channel called vh1 uh, i think people around the world might know of that that was in 2016 but now she has a podcast and it's called i hope they're not listening which is kind of a clever title uh so she's a celebrity yeah of some note and about a month ago and i'm not really sure why it's only making a headline today literally today but that aside about a month ago The special guest on her podcast was Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, and I don't think I have to explain to this audience who he is. It was an hour-long interview, and uh, here is uh, one part of the interview had to come, came to the topic of astrology, and specifically Mercury in retrograde, all right? And uh, here is what Amber said. Depending on where the planets are, can that affect us physically? 
like Mercury in retrograde. Everyone says it's, you know, Mercury in retrograde. You're going to have arguments with your significant other, or it will affect your body, or it'll give you pain. Is that a real thing? And do you believe in that? That's what she asked Neil. So she was asking it like genuinely and just curiously. Yes. Okay. Yes. But it, 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 this go, you know, ah. there's more. Yeah. <laughs> Neil answers, the good thing about science is when it's true, it's not a matter of whether you believe in it. It's true at all times. And he goes on to explain uh, why uh, the apparent motion of the planet Mercury, you know, appears to move backwards in the sky and was not understood at a time when people thought the Earth was the center of everything. Right. So and then she replies to that. So you're saying there's no truth to that. It's just made up astrology. And Neil answers, it's complete BS. Left over from a time when people's egos were so large that they actually believed that a planet in the sky gave a rat's ass about anything <laughs> in your life, which is a very funny line. But that's the line that I guess, you know, made everyone in the world of astrology not not too happy. But Amber Rose then laughs and says, I just want to say that question was from Wiz Khalifa, I believe. Who, and that's a name I have heard of, another musical artist. She said, not me. And then she said... She acknowledged that she's a Libra, and they go on to talk about the horoscope a little bit. So are horoscopes for just entertainment purposes, she asks. And he basically says, Neil confirms that, and she says, yeah, I'm with you on that. All right. So by this interview, at least this segment, because it's an hour-long interview, this is about an eight-minute segment I watched of the interview, it would seem to say, like, okay, she seems, you know, kind of reasonable approach, asking questions about it, Right. And basically saying, I'm with you, you know, I don't understand. But guess what happened a week later? Amber Rose has another guest on her show. Tarot card reader Ryan Liu. Yeah. One week later, she has a tarot card reader on the show and apparently learned nothing from the Neil deGrasse Tyson interview on the show. Because in this interview with Ryan Liu, she reveals that she goes to psychics has re and has been going for years. She's had tarot card readings done in the past, and she might be a little bit more familiar with astrology than she probably let on in that Neil deGrasse Tyson interview. So she says, let's talk about Mercury in retrograde with, with uh, Ryan Liu. And she says, I have no idea what that is. Okay. Why? So this came after the Neil deGrasse Tyson interview. Why she said she has no idea what this is, is a bit of a disconnect, at least for me. She Okay, so maybe she said it to stir up conversation, but oh my gosh, come on. A week ago, you had just spoken to one of the premier science communicators on the planet, and now you're asking a tarot card reader to explain Mercury in retrograde? Jesus. I mean, this would have been a better question. She, was, she should have said to him, I, I had Neil deGrasse Tyson on my show last week. He gave the explanation of Mercury in retrograde. He says all astrology is BS. Right. What is your thoughts on that? That would have been an infinitely better way of striking up that particular conversation. So come on. The takeaway here is that, look, any glimmer of real science that tried to penetrate this this particular celebrity bubble in which Amber Rose and her fans exist in, that was washed away seven days later when the tarot card reader came on to spout gobbledygook and nonsense for the better part of an hour. Now, in conjunction with that, there was another article that came out this week. <laughs> and this news was shared with me by one of our longtime listeners, and he's a good friend of the show, Adam Russell. You may know him as the bass player for the band Story of the Year. And if you haven't listened to their music, I highly recommend it. Adam shared this with me. NFL draft prospect, that's the National Football League. National Football League draft prospect, his name's Tyler Owens, says he doesn't believe in space and other planets. That's that's how that headline read. So Tyler Owens is considered one of the fastest prospects in the 2024 NFL draft class. So he's going to be a rookie this year coming up. He's highly, highly touted, brilliant athlete. But he was speaking to reporters at what's called the NFL Combine. And that's a place where you go basically to show off your skills so that the teams kind of get an idea of where they want to draft you in their draft that comes up every April. And he revealed that he doesn't believe in space or other planets, and he subscribes to flat Earth theories that he believes are interesting and have valid points. And uh, by the way, he has five years of college that he attended. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so here's the, here's the exact thing. It was like a 30-second clip. I'll give it to you. Here's exactly what he said. I don't believe in space. You know, I'm religious, so I think like we're on our own right now. I don't think there's other planets and stuff like that. I used to believe in the <sighs> heliocentric thing. Like, what? we used to revolve around the sun and stuff, but then I started seeing flat Earth stuff, 
And I was like, that's kind of interesting. They started bringing up some valid points. I mean, I don't know. It could be real. It could be bull. I just don't know. Wow. And, I'll, I'll, and I'll give you this to chew on before we talk about it a little bit. There's another football player, that uh, Travis Kelsey, and maybe you've heard of uh, him from the Kansas City Chiefs. You know, he's with uh, oh, Taylor Swift. Swift. Ta- Taylor <laughs> Swift, right? The two of them are, you know, popular together, whatever. So maybe that's it. And he has a brother who also played in the NFL, Jason Kelsey, who in a recent interview, I guess they have a podcast as well. Everybody's got a podcast. So on the, on the Kelsey's podcast, Jason uh, – said this. He said he came out saying that people people would not believe the number of NFL players who believe that the earth is flat. Here's what he said. I was once on the practice field last year. This last year, 2023. One of our coaches was walking by and I said to him, man, how many people do you think on this field believe the earth is flat? And, and his coach said to him, I don't think anybody here out here believes that. And he corrected him and said, you'd be surprised. If you start polling, you would be totally surprised. And before I even finished that, somebody else, another player, said right next to me, I mean, how do you know that it isn't flat, right? As conversation struck up. And this is something that I've because been the moon. assuming for, for quite a while, is that because there have been incidents of other athletes coming out and speaking specifically about flat earth comes up. You know, Shaquille O'Neal is probably a popular name you've heard. Um, that, that has talked about it before and that got covered. Another a basketball player named Kylie Irving, uh, also came out and said this a couple of years ago. I think we may have even talked about it on the show, but for some reason, flat earth has a bit of a grip on the professional athlete community to a deeper degree than even the media is probably aware of. So, you know, celebrity culture, athlete culture, I kind of, in a way, lump them together, you know, cause of the popularity and, and, you know, exposure that, that they all get to, to so many people. But, oh, my gosh, it's just – it just is remarkable that these Mark things – have... He gave you a pause too. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, that, they, that it's ing- – there's a cultural aspect to it. I mean, in the culture of these businesses, almost that 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 these are accepted ideas that that roam around these circles. Certainly, you and we we know this. We've we've experienced this ourselves and have done some research, you know, certainly into this, and we get some glimpses through the media of it. But it's probably more pervasive than we even realize. Why Those do you think that thoughts. is? What do you think it is about professional athletics that? Has that draw? Or do you think it's the same as in the general population from a percentage perspective? That's a fair point. And the other day, what was I looking up? I was looking up some recent polling on flat earth and how many people believe, you know, really, that an earth is flat. I looked at two different polls. I saw, found one that was taken last year in which in that particular poll – and again, you know, polls – an individual poll is an individual poll. So take it for what it is. But that 10 percent – of people in that poll of U.S. citizens, U.S. people in the United States at least, uh, believe uh, that there's some something to a flat Earth, that some what? aspect of flat Earth is correct. <clears throat> and then I also found one. This was back in 2019, so it's a little old. But only 66% of people in that survey stated that the Earth was round, right? You know, maybe some of them thought it was flat or a cube or a triangle or something else, but something other than, right? Only two out what? of three people believe that the earth is some shape some roundish shape and that, those like, are the polls this was I'm like a, a, a gallup poll or was this like a flat earth friends and family poll these are i mean if you like they were like it was like a legitimate polling organization carsey school of public policy had one of these polls that's the 10 percent of respondents agreed with conspiracy claims that the earth is flat and Nas- oh at nasa also faked the moon landing and then the yeah. other one let's see if i can find the other one here why do some people believe it? University of Melbourne, apparently? Oh gosh, that's so scary. Out of that one. So, you know, <laughs> so if universities and schools are, are, are conducting these, there's, you know, there, that, that gives it some, some weight, I think. Yeah, I mean, it, it at least means they're not actively seeking out flat earthers for their poll. You know what I mean? Right. It's, it's a, yeah, they, I don't they know how, how random to, the right. sample is, but yeah, that's yeah. right. They didn't go to the Flat Earth Convention to exactly. take this poll or, or something like that. <sighs> but yeah, these things, even though they're they're probably more ingrained than we even realize 
And I don't know how you get that out. It's so tough. It's so tough to change it. Yeah, it's hard to even know what to make of that. It's like, so that's, on the one hand, you got to believe it's a pretty massive failure of our public educational system. But, you know, on the other hand, I think it's also just the misinformation on the internet. You know, it's the combination, I think, of those two things primarily. That people, that 10% of people know so little about basic science that they cannot defend themselves from this sort of blatant childish misinformation on the internet, right? That's, that has to be happening. How, I mean, how ignorant of science do you have to be to say, well, who knows what, how do we know that the earth isn't flat? I mean, well, because the stuff you should have learned when you were in third grade. I mean, but- that's the thing that's so frustrating, too, is like these professional athletes generally, at least in the U.S., have college degrees. Right. Most professional yeah. athletes are expected and some required to go to universities. That's where they play. That's where they get recruited from. Yeah, but the upper echelon, I mean, how, I mean, how much do they really make sure that they, you're, they're buckling down with their studies. I mean, I know it's a... I get that. I get but that. But it's not like the environment exposure. that they're in is fostering some yeah. sort of pseudoscience culture to begin with, right? Exactly. So you, you would think there would be some... You know, some something working against them coming coming to these kinds of conclusions just because of their surroundings that they're steeped in for 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 you know four or five years in some cases. All right, thanks, Evan. Yep. Well, everyone, we're going to take a quick break from our show to talk about our sponsor this week, Aura Frames. Aura Frames are digital picture frames that are perfect for sharing photos of all the things that your family members can't be there for. From family vacations to graduations, you know, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, aunts, uncles. It's a perfect gift for all of them for any occasion. So guys, we gave our mom her aura frame about a year ago. And every time I go see her, she tells me how much she loves it. Like she brings it up every time because, you know, there's there's like a thousand or two thousand pictures on there, you know. So I have to say this is probably the best gift we've ever given her because number one, she still has it. And number two, she's still using it. Right now, you can save on the perfect gift that keeps on giving by visiting AuraFrames.com. For a limited time, listeners can get $20 off their best-selling frame with code SKEPTICS. That's A-U-R-A-Frames.com, promo code S-K-E-P-T-I-C-S. Terms and conditions apply. All right, guys, let's get back to the show. All right, Bob, now come on. There, you really telling me now that the magnets are good enough for fusion reactors? What's going on here? Okay. Um, <laughs> sure, Steve. <laughs> yeah, you may have missed a huge fusion milestone recently. Engineers have signed off on a revolutionary new superconducting magnet that created the most powerful high temperature magnetic field ever created on Earth 20 Teslas. Uh, this, now, this magnet was created with the express purpose of bringing commercial fusion to the world. How did they do this? And could this actually get us real fusion before all of us on this podcast are dead? <laughs> they released six peer-reviewed papers uh, in a special edition of the March issue of IEEE Transactions on Applied Superconductivity. So, okay, first Tesla in this context is obviously right, a measure of the strength of a ma- magnetic field. One Tesla equals 10,000 Gauss. Um, a 20 Tesla magnetic field doesn't sound big, but it's pretty huge. Uh, Earth's entire magnetic field is about 50 micro Tesla. That's point zero 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 five Tesla. Let's start with the birth of this amazing magnet, or perhaps its conception. Uh, might be a better word. One was it was only as recent as 2015 when this is a, this is a fun story. The MIT physicists were uh, just thinking about. You, about fusion and superconductivity, and they ran some numbers on how powerful a magnetic field could be if it were if it were created using the latest commercially available superconductors, right? So, and they were so impressed with the results, they looked at the numbers and said, "Wow, look at what's now possible!" That they then formed a company called Commonwealth Fusion Systems to make it happen. Uh, amazing story. Now, their goal was was to create a commercial fusion reactor that they call a spark reactor. Uh, now, ARC may sound familiar. ARC stands for Affordable, Robust, and Compact, uh, but it's obviously a blatant homage to Iron Man, right? Tony Stark's his ARC reactor, um, and Tony did go to MIT after all, which is why I think they're just so so enamored. Um, <laughs> Spark stands for smallest possible ARC reactor, and that's what they're 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 building here. So this is a Takamak, and Takamak 
mainly means that you're trying to create fusion energy using magnetic fields in a donut shape, a toroidal shape, to, con to contain this ridiculously hot burning plasma to create more energy than is put in, right? That's what fusion is trying to do. Um, now, you may have heard on this, on this podcast and elsewhere, if you're into this at all, ITER, I-T-E-R, I believe that's how it's pronounced, International Thermonuclear, Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor. That's the biggest fusion project in the world. 35 countries are involved, and that's a Takamak design as well. Um, the other big design player in this field um, is inertial confinement as opposed to magnetic confinement, and that uses lasers to compress fuel pellets. Right to initiate the fusion, we've talked about that on the on the podcast many times, and that's had some major successes recently, which we don't need to go into right now. You know, this MIT approach though is the most exciting to me. This this is using the latest technology to do what no other approach really may be able to do, and that is to be commercially viable and do it fairly quickly. Um, and the linchpin the linchpin for this goal is making that all important magnetic field, not only making it the most powerful ever, but also making it cheaper and simpler at the same time. And you, that sounds kind of silly, right? Usually those attributes are diametrically opposed, right? But I'm looking at all the, the, their results and their testing, and it really seems that they have achieved that goal. It is, I mean, based on, on their papers and what I've read, it seems they obviously have achieved that goal. The question then becomes, of course, where, where can they go from here? But let's get back to some of these details. This magnetic field, this really is the, um, the hero of the story. Um, what was the key to this field? And it really was this new material called – it's got a nickname. It's called Rebco. And that stands for it's, – it's a rare earth barium copper oxide that was added to the design of these, of these fusion magnets. So now this is what allows them to reach a working superconducting temperature of 20 kelvins. That's 20 degrees above absolute zero. Now that doesn't – that sounds pretty damn chilly, right? It's only – it's still 20 degrees away from absolute zero. So that's mighty cold. But before Rebco though, such a superconducting fusion magnet – like ITER uses, by the way, would have to be cooled to 4 Kelvin. That's, that's you know, 16 degrees colder, and it's only 4 degrees above absolute zero. So, uh, I mean, you might say, well, what, so what? That's still very close. It's only 16 degrees hotter, right, in Kelvin. But that is what is the major significance is. Because that difference, even though it's only 16 degrees, it allows them to call it, what they call it is, uh, they call it, high temperature superconducting because it's such a dramatic change. That, in, that increase allows for all new material properties and practical engineering. The biggest thing that I could find that this allowed is that Rebco allows the engineers to remove all the insulation that the old superconducting wires needed, right? You're wrapping all these, all these wires that are wrapped in insulation to prevent shorts. This new design allows them to remove all that insulation. And mo a lot of scientists said that can't possibly be a good idea. But that one change made a dramatic difference. Dennis White, professor of engineering, he's also the former director of MIT's Plasma Science and Fusion Center, said, he said, eliminating the layers of insulation has the advantage of being a low-voltage system. It greatly simplifies the fabrication processes and schedule. It also leaves more room for other elements, such as more cooling and more structure for strength. Oh, and there's one other thing I wanted to mention, that this, this power-up milestone that I'm talking about, that was not recent. That happened September 5th, 2021. So that was, you know, that's a few years ago. That was, that was the day of the big test when they booted up this, the, the, you know, their, their, new, um, their new device. And did you know how long it takes? How long do you think it takes to get down to 20, to 20 Kelvin to, to, to run this thing at maximum? Oh, uh, wow. Days probably. A week. Two weeks. Two yeah. weeks. Two weeks. To get, to get it, it's a, it's a very slow process, uh, but they did, they did it and it hit 20 Teslas, but that was in September 5th, 2021. Why is this in the news again? Because I actually forgot that it happened. It was, it was so long ago. I forgot it happened. I had to reacquaint myself with what they were actually doing here. And you, might, you may say, hey, Bob, what the hell took them so long? You know, that's a long time. Only now they're writing papers. Well, I went through what they actually have been doing all that time, and it kind of Makes sense that it would took that it would take this long. First off, they had to wait until their hangovers were gone, right? Because they were <laughs> they were celebrating big time because that was a major achievement. So, but after once they were ready to get back to work, they actually tore the whole magnet as assembly apart and inspected all the components. Then they analyzed the data from hundreds of instruments that recorded all of this stuff, probably petabytes of data. 
They put it back together and then they ran it really hard and then shut it down. They like turned off the switch, boop, turn off the power. And that is a worst case scenario for this for this type of magnet. It's called a quench. It could have literally destroyed all of their equipment. But they needed to – once they did all the previous tests, they needed to say, let's do worst case scenario and then we'll study what happens. And it turns out that it didn't destroy the equipment. It only melted some of the magnet, a very tiny – like 5% of its volume was actually melted, which was pretty small. So then they looked at all of their models and they had a bunch of models predicting what happens at each stage getting up to 20, 20 Tesla, and all of their models agreed on at what they found when they went to 20 Tesla. But when they quenched it and, and, and shut it down and created this catastrophic failure, they found that some of their models did not predict what would happen. So they threw those models away, and they kept only the models that, were, that, were, that correctly predicted the entire, the entire process from, from beginning to end. And they knew that these were the ones that were the most accurate. And then, of course, they documented everything in the form of these six reports that are online. I recommend you checking them out um, and also going through some of the more details. There's, there's so much to this that I'm just not even covering. So the bottom line assessment of the engineers after all of this research is that their predictions and compu- computer modeling were incredibly accurate. And they confirmed that the magnet's new design could absolutely serve as the foundation for a future fusion fa- uh, power plant. Um, and it, it really is quite an achievement. It's the first large-scale, high-temperature, high-field superconducting magnet, and they brought it together with supply lines and efficiencies in mind. It's amazing what they accomplished. Professor White described this as the most significant thing, in my opinion, in the last 30 years of fusion research. Uh, sure, okay, the guy is a little biased, but that's 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 a powerful statement. He says that essentially – this was interesting. He says that pre – this isn't a direct quote. This is basically what he what he was was saying was that previously, before this, the best fusion magnets of the world, he believes that they could have potentially achieved fusion energy, but only as something like a showcase, like a one off, uh, if it even could have got if they even could have gotten that far. Uh, he thinks that using magnetic confinement with only a moderate field and moderate density would never make practical sense or be reasonably economical. He, he, you know, so he says that they could have done this. They could have actually said, look, we've achieved significant fusion, uh, and there's lots of ways you can characterize that. But he thinks they could have potentially have done that, but it never would have been anything that would have been economical or, or practical to pull off. And I think he would also include Eater, by the way. I really feel sorry for Eater because when they, when they designed this Takamak, that they put billions of dollars into and all the, all this research, they they locked in the, the the superconducting magnets. They locked in that design, and after these improvements, they could not they could not change their design. And I, I think that they're looking and they're saying, "Oh my God, we should have waited a few years until we could have used this new superconducting technology to have these much smaller and much more intense magnetic fields, superconducting fields, magnetic fields, because." That's what would make it so much more less expensive and, and actually in more simple. So White also says uh, regarding that test from September 5th, he says, um, overnight, it basically changed the cost per watt of a fusion reactor by a factor of almost 40 in one day. He said, now fusion has a chance. That's kind of the uh, my assessment of, uh, of what they did. But of course, I got to end this and I got to say, you got to keep in mind, this is fusion research. It's ridiculously complex. And just because uh, MIT uh, has had this major success, they still could be and probably will be, there probably will be major delays. But I believe they're expecting a working test reactor like this decade and a full scale commercial reactor, uh, like an arc reactor or spark reactor in the 2030s. I think that's probably still um, optimistic. But having this type of reactor and simplifying as they have done and creating these these basically they've got these recipes for here's how you can create these these magnets and here's how here's the supply lines and here's the efficiencies that we've achieved uh, they really have i think an amazing foundation for a, a new a new type of tokamak reactor using these high field uh superconducting magnetic fields that could really make a difference you know whenever the time does come i think this could give it a really good shot at being really commercially viable. Yeah, it's just so <laughs> really hard. I mean, this kind of this makes it slightly more likely, I think, to, to happen. <laughs> but I don't know. We're still. You said, oh, it's 
reduce the cost by 40 times, but aren't we like orders of magnitude away from producing enough energy that the whole thing works? You know what I mean? Like we we reached um, that point where in the moment, you know, that we're creating fusion, it's putting out more energy than went into it, but it's still only 1% of the total energy that got to that point. We have to generate 100 times more energy to yeah. get to like net energy. Yeah, but don't confuse the inertial confinement with the magnetic confinement. The inertial confinement, that's that... Um the uh was it the slack uh was was that had they had done a couple of years ago was an amazing milestone they've reached the, what were some of the things that they reached like ignition and one of the types of ignition they they really made some great milestones and you're right the the energy that they created was far in excess of what they actually put on that that um that pellet that hulcrum uh so yeah and so it's and they're very slick they're very sly because they because they characterize it in a way that you don't no, you don't really realize that, oh, no, wait, they created so much. They, their lasers were so powerful and only a tiny fraction of it ever got onto that hulkrum. Um, so uh, so they're, they're, they're a different beast. I, I want to see a Takamak, a serious Takamak like this one actually working before I'm really as pessimistic as I am with the uh, inertial confinement fusion. Um, this, and and this, this looks like a, a wonderful foundation. And, and if, if it's going to happen, I think – I think you clearly need um, a reactor like this one. That is much the more powerful it is, the less the less power you need for everything else, and the cheaper everything is. If it's going to work, this is going to this is going to do it. Um, this is the only one that even has a shot because I think I don't I don't think any other technique, uh, especially you know, other tokamaks like Eater and and inertial confinement. I don't think they really have a shot to be commercially viable. They may create. A test bed. Oh, look, it works, but there's no way we're going to make this commercial and, and and create plants all over the world. That's not going to happen, I don't think, with these other technologies. This one's got a shot. Like like White says, now fusion has a chance. It didn't have a chance before this. Now it does. I I, I hope he's right. All right, thanks, Bob. Jay, it's who's that noisy time? Okay, guys. Last week I played this noisy. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's one of, remember they used to have those little toy cannons on the desk or something? You'd pull the string back and fire the cannon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A little pellet or something would come out. So All right, so like a, I had a lot of people. Little cannon and pellet. Yeah, I yeah. remember that. I remember that thing. All right, so we had, I had a lot of guesses. A lot of people were in the right place, but I did get one correct answer on this one. So let's get through these. So a listener named Chris said, Hi, Jay. This week, I think the noisy is first the sound of an explosion. Then the second part is the shockwave reaching the camera and knocking it over. Hmm. That's interesting. I mean, I absolutely think that if the shockwave hit the camera, it probably would be more more of a noise. But but I under, I get what you're you're aiming at there. Jim Kelly said, Hi, Jay. I think the answer to this week's noisy is the following. Sound one, a potato gun being fired. Sound two, the potato hitting its target off in the distance. Um, for some reason, that one made me laugh. It is not a potato gun. Because potatoes are funny. Yes. I had, <laughs> <laughs> I had two close guesses. Well, I had many close guesses, but these were the, the first two I got in. This is from Tim Welsh. He said, hey, Jay, I think I know what this one is. I think it's someone doing a single hard clap, first in an echo chamber, second in an anahoic chamber. I'm definitely confident if it's not a clap, it's at least two of those scenarios. And the second guesser said, uh, his name is Eddie Anthony, and he said, Hi, Jay, I bet you get a lot of correct guesses on this one. I remember that noisy from a TV show or YouTube video. I just can't for the life of me remember what show it was. The object is a revolver being fired. The first clip is recorded in a mine shaft or tunnel. Um, and the neck, the second one is, the second clip is the same revolver being fired in a room designed to absorb sound. Okay, so these two were on track here. The winning answer came in from Harley Hunt, and Harley said, Good day, my guess for who's that noisy is a balloon. Specifically, a balloon being popped in a sound-enhancing room for the first time and then a sound-dampening room for the second time around. So this is correct. So what, hmm. what I saw was a video of someone popping a balloon, and they popped it in, a, in basically a room that has a lot of acoustic surfaces, so there was a lot of reverb. And the second one was popped in a, a, a sound reinforced room where you, if you've seen them, basically there's an incredibly large, like it looks like foam, but there's these really long, like pyramid like shapes in there that absorb most of the sound. And that same exact sound 
was made in these two different rooms. I mean, what the hell with that second one? <laughs> so there's no reverberation, which means the sound waves that are being created are are not bouncing off of anything, which mm-hmm. which significantly lowers the volume and the and the length of the reverb or the decay of the sound. Just a super interesting idea when you think that those are the exact two same sounds, you know, with the, with the same distance from the camera and everything. Just uh, amazing. I think that those rooms must be. First off, I'm sure they cost an incredible amount of money to make, but I've heard people say that when they go in that it's it's actually uncomfortable to be in there because we're so trained to you know we're used to hearing the the sounds that we make and sounds around us like bouncing off of surfaces and there's like room noise, you know, we're just acquainted with that. But when you're in a room where there isn't any of that, you know, you, you can people report that they can hear their heartbeat inside those yeah. rooms. Very strange. Mm-hmm. Anyway, that was a great Who's that noisy? I really thought that was cool. I have a new one for this week, guys. And this one was sent in by a listener named Nat. get the idea oh yeah uh so if you think you know what this noisy is or you heard something cool this week you can email me at wtn at the steve we have a few shows planned right now so the mm-hmm. private show in dallas is sold out the extravaganza in dallas is still available and if you're interested if you're going to be down there to see the eclipse uh, try to try to join us at that extravaganza you can go to the to buy tickets for that now, we're also making plans for shows in Chicago in August. Um, we, we're going to have an extravaganza, which tickets are available now for. We're going to have a private show, which tickets will be available very soon, maybe by the time that this recording comes up. I'm just you know crunching a few more details. Um, but those tickets, if, they're, if not this week, will probably be available next week. All of this can be found on the skepticsguide.org website. All right. Thank you, Jay. We got a cup just a little bit of feedback from last week's show. We talked, remember, about uh, in vitro fertilization and frozen fertilized eggs being considered a child based upon Alabama Supreme Court precedents now. And we talked a little bit about IVF itself in the process. And a few people pointed out, and I looked into this, um, that as you know, as IVF procedures have gotten better, they are able to implant a single fertilized embryo uh, rather than doing multiple. What they wow, do is... so even more goes to waste. Yeah, but what, this is what they do. But the thing is, they, so they'll, you know, you, they'll try to get like 20, you know, 10 to 20 eggs donated. Then they, they do the in vitro fertilization. And then they, the, the eggs, well, it's either successful or it's not successful. And then the successful ones are either like high quality or medium quality, right? So then they implant one high quality fertilized egg. So they've just gotten a, let, a, a lot better at the technology, and the success rates a lot higher with even with an individual egg because they're, again they're they're picking the high quality one. But the th- but it still gives you the same situation. In order to do that, you need to waste all, all of the not high quality embryos, right? Like there's no way to do that without there being you know embryos that are going to be discarded at some point. We predicted that the Alabama legislature would, you know, carve out an exception for IVF, and they they're in the process of doing that, pretty much exactly as predicted. Um, they're not reversing any aspect of the the Supreme Court decision that child means unborn child, which means embryo, which means frozen embryo, right? They're just saying, yeah, if, once you're fertilized, you're a person, you're a child, you know, no matter where you are, what the mm. situation is. Um, and they're, so they're not reversing that or undoing that or softening that. They're just saying, yeah, this doesn't apply to IVF, right? That's it. Just carving <laughs> out an exception for IVF. Out. Yeah, because they just don't want to deal with that. But even that was controversial within, like, you know, the, the Republicans in Alabama. Oh, boy. Well, there was an interview that I saw today with, with one of them that was saying, well, they just shouldn't make any more than they use, right? 
They should oh, just they should make a single one and plant a single one, and that's it. And he's like, I know. Did he say, expensive. I'm not a scientist, but yeah. Yeah, right? before yeah. saying that. But yeah, that, but of course, that doesn't work. It's not how the process works. <laughs> you need to make a bunch of them so that you, because they're not all successful and they're not all high quality. And what if you want to have multiple pregnancies and blah, blah, right. blah. It's just, yeah, it's just a right. terrible it's idea silly. all around. Um, Okay. It's a terrible idea. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, thanks, oh, we, 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 all yeah, together we, now. Said all that. around. Uh, okay. uh, yeah, all together now. <laughs> another email comes from Hugh Phillip, and Hugh writes, I believe you said the moon's path around the sun is always concave. I think this implies a very particular condition, that the moon-Earth distance is approximately one-thirteenth the distance to the sun, which it clearly is not. The velocity of the moon in Earth's reference frame never comes close to velocity of the Earth-moon system around the sun, so the path of the moon around the sun must be like a distorted sine wave, meaning there are concave and convex parts of the orbit with redirect to the sun. Maybe I misheard. Um, but I'm busy, and it's only in the middle of the night when I wake up that I remember these things from my commuting podcast. <laughs> I've done that. Yeah. So, all right. So, you know, I, I knew this was absolutely correct, and I also found some references, some recent references, astronomy.com. Everyone has these, you know, any, all the astronomy places have this. So what I said was, was correct. The, if, you, if you map out the orbit of the moon around the, the sun, it's, it never is concave away from the sun it's always concave towards the sun it's hard to imagine because it's hard to get the scale in your head you know what i mean the but but just if you do the math or if you actually map out the orbit and again uh, we'll have links to sites that go over it in detail that's true the moon is always you know what i mean by concave to the sun it's always sort of bending towards the sun it's never in the its orbital pathway never go curves away from the sun so that's objectively non-controversially true and you know Hugh I sent him the links and he he agrees with that there in you no know, he just said yeah he just wasn't thinking about it mathematically correctly uh but there's another interesting but you know, I brought this up as just kind of a, I was being funny you know cuz Bob was talking about the orbit of the moon and I said yeah but does the moon orbit around the earth or does it orbit around the sun <laughs> now it's an interesting question, sure. and this is only one piece of information that, that is relevant to that question. The answer is actually sounds like circular logic, but it isn't. The answer uh, is the Earth, the, the moon revolves around the Earth because the moon revolves around the Earth. But let me explain that. <laughs> there is something uh -huh. called the hill limit or the hill sphere. So that is oh, the yeah. yeah, so the zone within which something is captured by the gravitational pull of an object, right? So within the Earth's hill sphere, something is, is, in, in, the, is in the orbit around the Earth. The thing is, if it weren't within the hill sphere, it would drift away into its own orbit around the sun, right? So the fact that it is okay. in orbit around the Earth means that it's within the hill sphere, and therefore it's within orbit around the Earth. So it sounds circular, but it means if it were if it wasn't orbiting the Earth, it would not be you know a, a consistent distance from the Earth and captured by the Earth. It would drift off and just orbit the Sun. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah. yeah. Which is yeah, why okay. which is why <laughs> Venus and Mercury don't have moons because they yes. they don't have basically uh. any hill sphere. There's there no moon could be captured. Can't overcome it. Yeah, they could over... Can't overcome the sun. Exactly. They're, those are too close to the sun to overcome the gravity of the sun. Wow, we're even more Goldilocks zone than we thought. Mm. So that was that was interesting little follow-up. All right, guys, it's time for Science or Fiction. It's time for Science or Fiction. Each week, I come up with three science news items or facts, two real and one fake, and then I challenge my panel of skeptics to tell me which one is the fake. We have a theme this week. The theme is relevant because it is almost daylight saving time. Oh, Bob. You and I. Oh, oh. Boy. We love our long summer days, don't we? Who doesn't? Yeah. You guys ready? Mm -hmm. Three yep. items related sure. to daylight savings time. Item number one, a study of over 200,000 malpractice claims finds that daylight saving time is associated with worse severity of incidents and higher average payments than standard time. Item number two, 
Credit for the first serious proposal proposal of daylight saving time goes to entomologist George Vernon Hudson, who presented the idea in 1895 because he wanted more time in the evening for bug collection. And item number three, among its many detrimental effects, daylight saving time is associated with an increase in overall crime compared to standard time. And yes, it is daylight saving time, singular, not daylight yeah, saving no time. Yeah, but that's but, a very common. But we still say savings. Yeah, yeah, daylight saving. A lot of people hmm. say savings. And when I was look, when I was yeah, doing research, they, a lot of people write daylight savings time, but it's saving time. Okay, I know this is a s- so. S- are we on daylight saving right now, or are we on? No, standard we're about right? to. No, we're about about to go on. About okay, go on. so Sunday. daylight saving is when you're. Da- yeah, it's when you save daylight. We're on There's standard time more now. Sun. Okay. Yeah, daylight gotcha, gotcha, saving gotcha. time is yeah. over the summer. Way to think about it, Bob. Go first. All right. Um, so going through mal- malpractice claims, daylight savings associated with worse severity of, se- of incidents and higher average payment. Wait, payment? Yeah, the award. You know, for the payment of how much you get paid for losing your malpractice suit. Okay, from wow. standard time. Who knows? Nobody knows the answer to this stuff. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, something about this entomologist sounds wacky. I'm going to say that's fiction. That's all I got. I can't think right now. Okay, Evan. Ooh, I get to go second. <laughs> all right. Uh, I, In a way, I think I may agree with Bob here, even though he didn't really give us some ins- – really any insight as to his decision. Uh, all right. The first one, about thou- about 200,000 malpractice claims. Wow. Um, they found that daylight savings time associated with uh, is associated with worse severity of incidents, severity of incidents. Hmm. Well, maybe not. And higher average payments than standard time. It has to meet both those criteria. So, I mean, you know, this kind of gives it some wiggle room to it for it to be the fiction. There's a lot, there's several components here that could knock it out from being uh, science. But in a, in a way, it kind of makes sense because more daylight, more human activity, more incidents happen overall, and therefore more malpractice results <laughs> be due to the heightened activity that goes hand in hand with the extra time. I, Maybe. Um, the th- I'm going to jump to the third one. Uh, detrimental effects. There are apparently many. Daylight savings time is associated with an increase in overall crime compared to standard time. Overall crime. Okay. So, <laughs> I mean, we kind of think of crime as more of a nighttime activity, right? You know, the cloak of night as opposed to the broad daylight. You, you would think that that uh, would be the opposite then. But the second one about the first serious proposal of daylight saving time, I, okay, serious proposal. I mean, how do you quantify that? And the George Vernon Hudson presented the idea. And I, I know Ben Franklin at some point had an idea about daylight savings time or something close to it, but was it considered a serious proposal? I don't. That I don't know, and that's why I was leaning towards that one being the fiction. Now that I've had a chance to talk it through, and thank you all for listening to me talk it through, <laughs> I think I'll go ahead and change my answer. I think it's going to be the increase in overall crime compared to standard time. Um, I, 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 I think the opposite is correct there. Okay, Kara. Yeah, so I agree with Evan about some things. I disagree with him about others. Bob, you didn't give me a lot to agree with or disagree Kind of like real with. life. Um, (laughs) so the malpractice claims one, I think is probably science. I don't think it has anything to do with there being more daylight. I think it's because when we shift, our circadian clocks are screwy. Like we know that people get in more car wrecks. We know that, you know, we, we just were, we make, we have more accidents when our sleep is messed with and daylight saving messes with our sleep in both directions. So anytime there's a clock shift, I think that you're going to see... A change. I do agree with you, Evan, about the crime. I think you're going to. You think that pro- one's the I fiction? think it's opposite. Yeah, I think probably daylight. The uh, standard time is probably associated with, or you just made this one up. <laughs> but I would think that maybe standard time would be associated with more crime because same thing because more crime, especially violent crimes, um, car car thefts, things like that, are going to occur in the dark. 
Um, and then I comp- I had the exact same thought about Ben Franklin. I 100% remember that Ben Franklin did muse about daylight saving, but maybe that's the thing. Maybe he, it was – he was a muser. I mean, you read a lot of his oh, old yes. stuff. There's lots of In musings, of lots of the – the almanac, what was it? The Poor Richard's Almanac. Oh, yeah, you know, poor he wrote Richard's a lot almanac of things like that. And, yeah. So yeah. I, I bet you he he did riff on the idea, but I bet you it wasn't a serious proposal, and that's the the kicker there. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go with what Evan said and say the um the crime one is the fiction. Okay, and Jay. Yeah, out of all these, I mean, when I read the third one, I felt like you know the one about the crime. I just feel like it would. I don't know. There doesn't seem to be a reason for that to happen. So I think uh, I agree with what Evan said. I think that's the opposite. So you all agree with the first one. So we'll start there. A study of over 200,000 malpractice claims finds that daylight saving time is associated with worse severity of incidents and higher average payments than standard time. We all think that one is science. And that one is science. That one is correct. Mm -hmm. Uh, So the, the, the two hypotheses they were testing is one, will people like make worse mistakes, you know, and leading to more and more severe malpractice suits. And the other one was our jurors cranky, you know, and so they can <laughs> get more money even for the oh, same crimes. Now, I didn't even think of that. I didn't even think of that. Interestingly, yeah. if you look at just the week following the changeover, the severity of incidents are not worse, but the awards oh. are still higher. And so they think that's the the cranky juror effect because everyone's sleep deprived. <laughs> so don't have your don't have the day, your decision day come down after on, after on the opposite side. Yeah, after of, you switch uh, the clocks. I was switching clocks. But oh but my the gosh. the whole like the many months of daylight of uh, daylight saving time had the more malpractice than the. Huh. You know, it, again, the cause and effect there is a little bit hard to to sort out, but that was interesting. That's what they found. All right, let's go to number two. Credit for the first serious proposal of daylight saving time goes to entomologist George Vernon Hudson, who presented the idea in 1895 because he wanted more time in the evening for bug collection. Bob, you think this one is the fiction. Everyone else thinks this one is science. And this one is (gasps) science. Sorry, Bob. I knew it. I knew it. So yeah, this, the, he this guy presented it to uh, the Royal Society of New Zealand, hmm. and was initially mocked for the idea. But his ideas um, that was in 1895. But by 1927, they were starting to become massively adopted in many nations. Did um, New Zealand adopt first? Well, that's interesting. No, I don't, yeah, not I necessarily. Th- no. That's so interesting because I think a lot of people kind of mistake this for like an American invention. A World War I artifact, a, a, an outcrumbing of Germany World War was I, the first country, right? actually. Germany was the uh, first country. Okay. Yeah. Um, and Evan, you're correct. Benjamin Franklin did have some musings about it, but he was joking. He sent a letter to France ah. where he joked about maybe you could get up earlier in order to burn less candles or something. Like it was not a serious <laughs> proposal. Uh, but it was the first time somebody said anything about like getting up earlier or whatever, like sh- changing <laughs> the the relationship to the circadian rhythm. But it wasn't like I'm formally proposing that we move the clock. But that wasn't he didn't do that. That was this guy to the Royal Society uh, in New Zealand. So that's why I, I, that's why I threw the, serious yeah. in there because mm-hmm. yeah, there it is. Ben, does, ben doesn't yeah. get credit because it was only joking. Oh, Ben, you <laughs> rascal! <laughs> <laughs> All right, this means that. Among its many detrimental effects, daylight saving time is associated with an increase in overall crime compared to standard time is the fiction because you're right. It goes down. Why does it go down? Because there's more light in the evening. But specifically, they think that the real the reason why there's a, a significant effect here is because it makes the difference between being light or dark when people are going back home from work, Mm -hmm. which means when you're going out into the parking lot and getting into your car, it's either dark or it's light out. And that is, if it's in the dark, that creates a huge opportunity for crime. Whereas if it's light out, that is a huge, you know, uh, disincentive to, obviously nobody wants to commit crimes in broad daylight. Um, So at least it goes down, right? Obviously it still happens, but uh, so that's, that's the thinking there that the, um, whether it's light or dark out when people are driving, getting into their cars and driving home from work or traveling on the subway or the trains or whatever, okay. it, it reduces. And it's a you know, significant effect that, that pretty much lasts for the entire 
duration of daylight saving time. So that's one good thing that happens from daylight saving time. I personally think they should make daylight saving time permanent, right? Like right. Yes. the time that is, yeah, that's just, should just be the, just not, don't switch the clock twice a year, but don't have it be permanent standard time, be permanent daylight saving time. We talked yeah, about this, I think, depressing. didn't we talk about this last year? And Bob, you and I were on the side arguing that if you're going to lock it in, lock it into savings time, daylight yeah. savings time. Saving yeah. singular, Evan. I'm so, oh shoot! Did I do? Yeah. Oh my gosh! We all do. Daylight saving time. <laughs> Why can't we just say it the way we've been always saying it our whole lives? You know? <laughs> yeah, right. Because that's not correct, Jay. No, because I mean, I, I agree. With you. I don't care about that. I just, you know, one of the things I came across when I was doing research yeah. on it. Gosh. I think people say it that way because it just rolls off the tongue a little bit easier. It's like, why do people say whole nother? It's easier to say, shut up. Because it's cares? the infix. Yeah. Yeah. There's a so whole grammatical thing, but I hate it and it makes me crazy. And I actively <laughs> say a whole other. A whole nother. Or I say another. Because I do think it makes us sound a bit dense. A whole nother. A whole nother. I think I said that for years and wasn't even aware of it. Most people aren't. Yeah, just because just it rolls off the tongue. A friend of mine who is not from the US pointed it out to me. And was like, you guys sound like yokels. And then I was like, damn it. Now that's all I can hear. <laughs> that you're right. Once it's pointed out to you, though, then it's like it uh-huh. get great. And you have to like uh-huh. retrain I mean, yourself to ignore it. Y'all is not a word either, really. But it should be because every other language has, <laughs> has, a, has a plural um, second person. Y- you all, y'all. Yeah. There's first person singular, first person plural, second person singular, second person plural, and third person singular, third person plural. Well, it's for interesting. Some reason in English, we don't have a second person plural. They, they, so y'all in, initially was second person plural, but then it started to get used as just singular. So then they had to add all. So now it's all y'all if it's more than Yeah, but that's plural. regional. Oh, yeah, my yeah. God. Yeah, in that's New- right. <laughs> in New York, it's use. <laughs> yeah, that's super regional. I still say y'all for more than one. I would never say y'all for one person. That's you. But some you people say guy. do. Yeah. No, I don't think they say y'all for one person. I think it's that y'all is a small group and all y'all is a big group. <laughs> oh, okay. All yeah. y'all. <laughs> oh, really? So awesome. Degrees. Ooh. Yeah. So let's say there's like, let's say you're teaching a, a full classroom. There's like 30 kids in your class and you point, okay, y'all are going to work on this, but all y'all together are going to make sure that you work on that. <laughs> I, I, never to- I totally that. get it. It's yeah, it makes sense, right? Uh, Sarah, I told you said that. I didn't even perceive the difference. That's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, stupid northerns, northerners <laughs> we are. You yanks. Right? You have no yanks. idea. Uh, Kara, so what does, well, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> that is an indication that we're about to switch tasks. <laughs> or that you have been here for too long and it's time for you to go. Jay, do you remember where Will? originated from and why we picked it up and know, haven't been able to drop it i don't know i mean I, I something tells me i made it up along the way i mean i must have heard it somewhere right i mean somebody said that before me i'm but... sure you heard it i'm sure you heard somebody say well yeah it's an affectation it's, it's, and you, when know, we're it's... there when we're in dallas you guys are going to hear fixing to oh you're going to hear a few texas oh, yes. so get ready for oh, it oh i haven't been to texas in so long yeah Kara, how good uh. is the barbecue oh it's the Best in the country. Don't write me in, but <laughs> you're right. Here we go. Unless North you agree with me, and then you can write in. all you want. There's something about Texas barbecue. It's smoky. It's a little mm. sweet. It's spicy. It's sticky. It's my favorite. I mean, granted, I was born in it. I'm biased, but it's my favorite. But I will tell you, it's not just the barbecue. It's the Tex-Mex. It's the queso. You guys, we're gonna eat like champs. I can't oh wait. Gosh. I can't, can't wait. Here I am trying to lose weight for it. Bar- I'm no, all back in three days. All of it. Yeah, and those. In that weekend, nothing counts. Just look at it that way. Yeah, I know. I'm just going to feel crazy. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy. All right, Evan, give us a quote. This week's quote was suggested by a listener, Corey, from Diggins, Missouri. I didn't know there was a Diggins, Missouri. Love it. So he wrote in the subject, Frank Herbert quote. Cool. Most deadly errors arise from obsolete assumptions. And that's from The Children of Dune, of course, written by Frank Herbert. Dune! Did anyone see Dune, Dune 2? Not yet. Awesome. Yes. It's Dune. incredible. It's awesome. So no spoilers, right? Because <laughs> all of us have not seen it yet? No spoilers. Definitely not. Definitely not. Thank you, Jay. Hear, hear. I mean, what do you want to not get spoiled? The plot of a 50-year-old book or a movie that came out 30 years ago? Don't you dare, Steve. <laughs> 
Don't go there. Don't piss people off on a technicality, Steve. Some of us have never read the books or seen the original movie. Uh, You're going to love it, Ev. Yeah, I can't wait. All right, well, thank you all for joining me this week. Sure, man. It was nice to be joined. My pleasure, sir. And until next week, this is your Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. Skeptic's Guide to the Universe is produced by SGU Productions, dedicated to promoting science and critical thinking. For more information, visit us at theskepticsguide.org. Send your questions to info at theskepticsguide.org. And if you would like to support the show and all the work that we do, go to patreon.com slash skepticsguide and consider becoming a patron and becoming part of the SGU community. Our listeners and supporters are what make SGU possible. 